We started this week with 227 Lincoln Douglas debaters, and you see before you the final two, who will be debating that compulsory inclusion of non-felons DNA by any government database is unjust. We'll allow that question to be settled by our esteemed debaters. We do know, however, that it is just that these two have arrived at this final round. On the affirmative, we do have L290, L290 on the affirmative. On the negative, L296, L... Before I begin my speech, there are a few people that I need to thank. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the National Forensics League, the Kansas City Host Committee, and Lincoln Financial Group for sponsoring this event. Uh, I'd also like to thank the LD Wording Committee for giving us such a great topic to debate. Uh, I'd also like to thank the coaches and judges that have made this entire tourna poss tournament possible. Um, uh, furthermore, I'd like to, to uh, have some personal thank yous. My teammates and other members of my district, my parents, uh, Josh Wesneski, Drew Shipley, and Cody Franklin for all their hard work helping me. And most importantly, my coach, Linda Shipley. I could not have done this without you, and happy birthday. Okay, now I will begin. Everyone has the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty and no one should be subjected to an arbitrary violation of property. Because a compulsory DNA database turns a country of citizens into a nation of suspects without probable cause, I affirm that resolves compulsory inclusion of non-felons DNA in any government database is unjust. To further clarify, I offer the following definitions. Compulsory, being coercive by means of force. Non-felon, any individual in a society not convicted of a felony. Unjust, that which is done against the rights of another. DNA database. According to the Thomas M. Cooley Law Review of 2003, a DNA database has been defined as a storehouse for genetic records which law enforcement agencies use for criminal identification purposes. Now before moving on, allow me to clarify the burdens of this round. As the affirmative, I must only prove to you that it is unjust for the government to demand the liberty of innocent civilians. Second, it is important to note that this round is not about the practicality of such a database, but of the compulsion's effect on human rights. Having said this, my value is human rights. Human rights can be defined as the basic freedoms to which all people are entitled. Since the resolution asks us to evaluate the justness of an action and justice centers around the protection of these human rights, this is clearly the highest value for the debate. The rights being questioned by the resolution are liberty, personal security, protection from self-incrimination, and self-ownership. The purpose of government is to protect these rights, not to irresponsibly harm them in the name of alleged safety. My criterion is justified government interference. The theory of justified government interference states that man is to be the ultimate sovereign over his own body and mind, and that the only time a government is justified in restricting rights is after one commits a harm against the rights of another. This is the paramount criterion because the resolution asks us to evaluate the state's capacity for justly restricting rights, and this provides us a standard of doing so. Contention 1. A compulsory DNA database obstructs justice. This concept is best articulated by journalist or by Stuart White, a lecturer in politics at Oxford University. Quote, a compulsory DNA database could well be counterproductive. If people feel they are being labeled as suspects by the police, even when they are not criminals, then this might make them less willing to cooperate with the police. He continues, the police are no longer an extension of us, the law-abiding majority, but become an alien power whom many of us fear and resent. Now, this resentment will only serve as a detriment to law enforcement as it shifts the role of a DNA database from an express lane to justice to a roadblock to justice. A perfect example of this can be found in the literature published by Gene Watch UK in 2006, which showed that per capita, convictions using the DNA database actually fell after the introduction of retention of records for non-convicted people. Furthermore, this massive expansion of governmental power will foster an over-reliance on, on the DNA database. 
According to the New York Times of March 14, 2010, any DNA sample left behind at a crime scene would become a smoking gun for the police. Now, everywhere you go, you leave behind DNA. Loose hair, skin cells, the gum that you covertly stuck to the bottom of the desk, you've left your mark. With a universal DNA database, we enhance the dependency on this database, meaning every innocent person could potentially leave behind this smoking gun. As we become more and more dependent on the database and the number of actual convictions decreases, we see a crisis in the justice system. Contention 2. A compulsory DNA database arbitrarily violates fundamental hu human rights. According to the resolution, the individuals whose rights are being questioned are non-felons, meaning they are innocent people who have done nothing to warrant an additional restriction of their rights. What is more, Article 11 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty according to law. However, Adam Rutherford, edi editor of the science journal Nature, states that this database serves as a suspect list for crimes not yet committed. The implication of this idea is twofold. First, this means the government is forcing people to give up potential evidence against themselves, thus violating the right to protection from self-incrimination. And second is that it shifts the mentality of the justice system to guilty until proven otherwise. Moreover, Article 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that no one shall be subjected to an arbitrary interference with his property. John Locke writes in the Second Treatise of Government that the individual has a right to decide what would become of himself and what he would do, and every man has a property in his own person. This right of self-ownership is the most sacred right of every human being, that of making your own decisions regarding your own body. The government is never justified in stripping every innocent citizen in society of this inherent right. At the point that the government compels you to surrender your DNA, this becomes an unwarranted seizure of your personal property. In conclusion, it is a fact that a compulsory DNA database will violate your human rights, but there is a negligible chance of your DNA directly helping you in any way. To put it simply, this is a guaranteed harm with absolutely no benefit. Without any logical cause or consequence, this compulsory inclusion breaches the threshold of the standards established by the criterion of justified government interference and is therefore unjust. Thank you, and I'm now open for cross-examination. Okay, let's begin on the burdens you establish in the round. What is the burden of the affirmative? Uh, as the affirmative, I must prove that it is unjust for the government to demand the liberty of innocent civilians. Okay, so what happens when we consider that in, in relation to what else happens to the rest of the population? So if I can, for example, prove that, yes, we demand this liberty from one individual human being, but we end up saving other people or helping other people, is that sufficient to negate? I'm sorry, can you re restate the question? Is it sufficient to negate if I prove that, yes, we may have taken liberty from some person, but ultimately, on the whole, we protect more people and more liberty? What you're showing, if you can prove that, is that the database is still unjust, but it might produce something good in the end. Well, but, but I'm saying when we have the debate here and we decide, does it help all, if it helps all people in general and takes the liberty maybe from one person, is it ultimately then a, still a good thing? No. Why not? Because the resolution is asking us to debate if the compulsory inclusion in the database is unjust. At the point that you include someone's DNA within the database arbitrarily, you are violating their rights, which breaches the threshold that I establish. Okay, so we something. can never violate the rights of any human being ever? That's not what I'm saying at okay, all. Okay, so when can we violate someone's rights? Well, if you refer to my criterion, we can violate someone's or restrict someone's rights uh, at the point they've committed a harm against the rights of another. Okay, so there is no other instance in which we could ever restrict rights? No. So then what do we do about a case in which, for example, a government requires us to do jury duty or um, takes things like eminent domain? What's the implication of those? Are those absolutely unjust? I'm sorry, can you restate the question? What happens when you have something like jury duty, which the government requires us to do? Is that a just as our role as a citizen? Is that absolutely unjust? Those are fulfilling some of your obligations as a citizen. That's not necessarily a restriction of your property rights. Okay, so why would an instance in which, for example, you give DNA for the good of the population as a whole, why isn't that serving well, your duty as a citizen? First of all, just because you give your DNA, that in no way equates
equates to a benefit as the population as a whole. Right. Well, that's what the negative is going to prove. But I'm just asking, and is it okay then to give up a right if you, if you ultimately end up helping people? Second of all is the fact that, at best, all you're doing is proving that this is an injustice against the person, but there might be some benefit afterwards. That okay. doesn't disprove that it's unjust. Okay, so for example, it would be unjust to hurt a single person to save the entire rest of the population because you've hurt that one person? That is an injustice to that person, so yes. I'm okay, so then how, and, and this, this, is, this is the way that like government should act. They should act in a way in which we consider anything unjust that harms anyone in any sense? At best, all you're trying to prove with, with these questions is that it might be practical or necessary, but that is not equivalent. Okay, so so then what's the difference between practical and necessary and justice? Justice is regarding the rights of these individuals, whereas right. practical is Right, but the rights of expedient. all individuals, right? Every individual has rights. Yes. Okay, so justice considers the rights of all individuals. Uh, I'm sorry? Does justice consider the rights of all individuals? Every individual has rights, yes. Okay, that's fine. Before I begin, I want to start with some thank yous. I have so many people to thank. To the NFL and Lincoln Financial and our hosts, the people of Kansas City. To my parents, to my teammates, Michelle, Adam, Nick, Brendan, Aneri, and the rest. To Jake Sonnenberg, who's not just my teammate, but for six years, my debate partner. To Gene Hybrex and Tom Hudnut and Harvard Westlake for believing in the value of debate and for giving me a team. To all the coaches in my life, Debbie Kahn, Sean Nadell, John and Kate, Victor, Tim, and Neil, and to my coaches now, Adam, Tara, Peter, and most of all, Mike Beats. If you're a debater at Harvard-Westlake or were at Edina a decade ago, he's absolutely changed your life. Thank you. All of you have given me so much, and I hope that, win or lose, I make you proud today, and that someday, all of you will have your DNA in a government database. <laughs> so let's get to business. I negate and value justice defined as giving each their due. Observation one. In the real world, notions of justice are comparative. It is important we do not confuse perfection with justice. Justice is concerned with creating a system that is able to treat the problems of society as they currently exist without being caught up in an impossible pursuit of perfection. Alan Lane, writing in the London Times, 09, explains. The long-range search for perfectly just institutions and hunt for spotless justice is ultimately regressive because societies full of actual human beings will never agree on a final perfect world. The search for a perfect set of arrangements for society can distract us from tackling real life immediate injustices. The perfect becomes the enemy of the good. Justice should be comparative, which examines what kind of people, what kind of lives people can actually lead. Abolishing slavery or giving women the right to vote would be just, even without creating a perfectly just society. This is the problem with the affirmative view of justice, which is that he's willing to call anything unjust, even if it helps people in general, because he claims that it hurts a single individual human being. But this is not an operable system of justice. This doesn't make sense when we talk about justice in the real world. Observation two. The use of DNA evidence is widespread and well-entrenched practice in law and criminal justice system. Sasha Polonsky writes the Washington University Law Quarterly, 05. DNA databases have taken root in the United States, both federally and across 50 states. Law enforcement agencies from across the globe continue to reap benefits of a computerized system that can match genetic material lifted from a crime scene and produce a hit. A confluence of factors is currently setting the stage for a vast expansion of DNA profiling. Thus, the genetic genie is already out of the bottle. With this in mind, the negative thesis is simple. Since the collection and use of DNA is inevitable, it is naive and pointless for us to debate about whether or not we should have DNA databasing in one form or another. Rather, the central question of the resolution is whether it is better to have a mandatory database that includes everyone, or a database in which we selectively include a person's data based on their status as a felon, for example. 
The criterion by which we answer the central question is minimizing discrimination. This criterion is vital to justice because laws can only provide justice if a criminal justice system is enforcing laws in an equal and non-arbitrary way. If its enforcement is unequal and arbitrary, then it's discriminatory, which does not give people their due by denying them their equal moral status with all their humans. Even if the purpose of laws is just, if the implementation of laws is unjust because it discriminates, then they must be considered unjust, and justice must be blind. My thesis and sole contention is that non-compulsory DNA databasing is discriminatory. In a non-mandatory system, DNA dragnets or the collection of a DNA from segments of the population that fit certain physical descriptions, live in certain areas, or share certain characteristics are the main method of sample collection. These dragnets disproportionately target and imprison minority populations, making minorities more likely to be convicted of crimes and majorities less likely to be convicted. Rebecca Peterson, writing in the American Criminal Law Review 2000, explains, the deficiencies of a current database have led law enforcement officials to increasingly resort to dragnet procedures that target a small section of the population for DNA sampling after a crime has occurred. A disturbing example occurred in an investigation for a serial rapist near Ann Arbor, Michigan, who was described by the victim as a six-foot-tall, quote, light-skinned black man. Black men who did not appear to be linked to the crimes, linked to the rapes through any evidence, were asked to provide blood samples for DNA analysis. If they refused, police obtained warrants and seized a sample. A universal DNA database containing DNA from every citizen could be used to identify and otherwise missed first-time offenders and render unnecessary discriminatory dragnets. A compulsory system would ensure that all citizens were treated equally by eliminating a selective inclusion that exists today. Michael Saringhouse, New York Times, 2010. A much fairer system would be to store DNA profiles for each and every one of us. This would eliminate any racial bias and negate the need for a familial search and be a far stronger tool for law enforcement. A universal record would be a strong deterrent to first-time offenders and would help prevent wrongful convictions. Let us move on to the affirmative case. First, he talks about the notion of what is unjust, but his notion of, un of justice is too limited. We have to consider the dues of all people. He concedes this in cross-examination and then continues to say, as long as, even if it helps the population as a whole, then it, it's, it, um, it doesn't matter, it's still unjust. But this is not a reasonable calculation of giving people their due. So, then he moves on to talk about the value of human rights. First, it would make sense to say we value justice because the resolution itself specifically tells us what is just. So we have to look to giving each person their due, which includes giving all people their due as an absolute necessity. Then he talks about justified government intervention. But this exists all the time. It exists in the case in which we take fingerprints of individuals and we store those. What's more, we actually take blood from every single baby born in the United States and we test them for certain diseases because we believe that it is in their best interest to technically violate their privacy or their rights in that, in that individual instance. Unless he can explain why this is so terrible, it would be unreasonable to consider this unjust. The phrase unjust should actually be practical and applicable. But when we begin to say that anything is unjust that may minorly violate technical include privacy, but is ultimately looking out for the best interest of any individual, that doesn't make sense. Let's move on to contention one. First, he says that people are going to begin to scare the police. But there's no reason why this absolutely has to be true. If we just become to accept it as a normal part of life and believe that, in fact, that, these are, that this DNA is to help us to make sure that we are considered innocent if we did not commit a crime, then people will just have more trust in the police, not less. Then he talks about the fact that crime actually, that he actually, that he's able to better solve crime. But here's the problem. The evidence he reads you has no causal analysis. It doesn't tell you one thing leads to another. It just says something was implemented and crime moved a certain way. That doesn't mean he's fixing the problem of crime. Then he talks about the New York Times evidence and, a and the fact that it's a smoking gun. But this isn't practical. We know that people are not constantly wrongly convicted from DNA evidence. DNA evidence is the most accurate form of evidence that's used, and it's not the only evidence we use at a crime scene. When we look at a crime scene, we look at a confluence of different factors, and we make sure that the person who has committed the crime based on other evidence, not just DNA itself, so there's no reason why this has to be true. What's more, if you want to actually be able to pr protect the rights of people and to obstruct justice, you would always have everyone included in a DNA database because they, when everyone is included, they are better able to fight against any kind of injustice. When you only have small groups like felons who are in a DNA database, you are more likely to have whatever rights of those people abused. Then he talks about the fact that it violates human rights. And there are a couple of different arguments under here. First is self-incrimination. This isn't what self-incrimination is. Self-incrimination is the verbal use of language to say, I did it. It is very, very different. Then he talks about the fact that it is some kind of unwarranted search. But I tell you, this exists all the time. We do it with fingerprints. We do it with babies. It can be very simple. We can put a patch of blood on someone's skin and easily solve any kind of, uh, 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 not a patch of blood, that sounds horrible, a pat sticky patch on someone's skin, and we can just remove uh, any DNA to then test it. Then he talks about the fact 
that, um, that ultimately he's able to solve these problems better. But the truth is we have to consider in light of alternatives. And the alternative of DNA evidence is actually eyewitness testimony, which is much, much worse. Jennifer Grady explains in the Journal of Mississippi, Mississippi Bar 03, DNA evidence is more liable than eyewitness testimony and decreases the current dependence on eyewitness testimony. Department of Justice reviewed 28 cases in which people wrongly convicted of sexual assault were later exonerated by DNA evidence. With the exception of six homicides, each case involved a significant reliance on DNA eyewitness, on eyewitness testimony. And here's the thing, we have to consider in terms of alternatives. It's absurd to say DNA is bad and other things are bad. If no DNA means that we use worse methods, then using DNA is bad. Good. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Great. <clears throat> I'd like to start with your value. It's justice, correct? Yes. You define this as each given their due? Yes, giving each their due. Okay. Now, according to the negative, what are people due? Well, I mean, I would say that they're due not to be discriminated against, right? That fundamentally that they join a government with the expectation that all people are going to be treated equally and fairly. Otherwise, they would have no incentive to be joining. Otherwise, they'd have okay. no incentive for protection of whatever other kind of rights. So a government has an obligation to absolutely protect those people. Okay, now how do you define discrimination? Well, I mean, I think I describe it using the evidence that talks about DNA dragnet, systems in which we go after certain people of socioeconomic groups or racial groups, and we target those people, we demand evidence from them, we incarcerate them as suspects, and then we end up, um, if, they, and if, if they don't want to give us our D, their DNA, then we take it through them by warrants. Okay, so discrimination is always a bad thing. I mean, I would say in the instances explained in the evidence, yes, discrimination is pretty bad. Okay, so your only contention talks about how the non-compulsory database uh, is currently discriminatory? Yeah, I talk about the fact that as it exists today, people have databases only for felons, which means we have to go out to the rest of the population and use discriminatory dragnets. If we expand it to everyone, we wouldn't have those problems, and we can solve it, and it's very simple. First, okay, we okay. Don't, once we have everyone, we can just go after, um, once we have everyone, we don't need to use the dragnets. And much more, if we get easy hits, and we say, this person did the, committed the crime, um, and we go and find the person, we don't have to have law enforcement officials, for example, being discriminatory in their practices. Okay, I'd like to stop you there. Now, now tell me, does pointing out flaws with the current system actually gain you any offense? Yes, it absolutely does. Because I tell you that we need to be able to implement a system of DNA, of compulsory DNA for everyone to solve the problems that exist in the real world, right? I'm debating, okay. I mean, practically, yes, this is a debate about values, but it makes no sense to, to consider values in the complete abstract. We have to consider those values as they exist in the real world. Otherwise, debate okay, becomes so a meaningless exercise. Okay, so let's look exercise. at the real world. You talk about, uh, in, a, in refutation of the affirmative case, you, you talk about uh, certain benefits that the negative can provide, correct? Yes, I mean... Okay, what benefits do you provide? Okay, well, first, I tell you that I'm able to eliminate DNA dragnets, right? A discriminatory okay. practice in and of itself. Second, I tell you that I get rid of any discriminatory process that exists via law enforcement officials because I get easier hits and therefore convict more people. Then, on the affirmative case, I tell you that I'm able, better, better able to solve the problems because, first, I have a system in which everyone is together, has their information given up, so any, every single one of them has an interest in making sure that it's not being um, violated or used inappropriately. And what's more, I tell you that the alternative, a system of eyewitness testimony, is always going to be worse because you're going to get wrongful conviction. So if you want to talk about due process or giving is people rights... Is that the rights, only alternative? What? Is that the only alternative? It is the alternative that exists in the world today. Before we use DNA testing or when we don't use it, we use eyewitness testimony. That's the Department of Justice analysis, their review done in the card explained by Jennifer Grady. Thank you. Let's look at my opponent's value of justice. I have two responses to this. First of all, he agrees with me in cross-examination that a, a facet of justice, essentially the key component, is human rights, that people are due their human rights. So let's focus on that. Innocent individuals are due their human rights and a degree of freedom from governmental coercion that the negative does not offer you whatsoever. Furthermore, I'd like to point out that what you do by voting for the negative is actually harm the rights of every single innocent person in society. In his last speech, he tries to say we can violate the rights of one for the rights of many. However, he's not violating the rights of just one, 
every single person in society will have the right to own yourself taken away from you by a negative ballot. Let's look at his criterion of minimizing discrimination. I'd like to point out that this is essentially the same as his first contention, so I'm going to group them because they all focus on discrimination. I have two responses. First is the fact that just because the current felon only database might have some kind of discriminatory uh, aspects, that has nothing to do with a justification of a compulsory uh, inclusion within a compulsory database. Essentially, this argument is not topical. The resolution asks him to justify this database, and all he's done is proving another database might be unjust. But furthermore, look to evidence by Mark Rothstein of the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. He states that this idea of racial profiling within the system is not true. This is a flaw with the criminal justice system that has nothing to do with the DNA database. I'd also like to point out that in society we do discriminate. We discriminate against criminals because they broke the law. My opponent tries to claim equality is a good thing, but equating an innocent individual with a criminal is definitely not justice. Do not accept this. Finally, in summary of my opponent's case, I'd like to point out that at best all he tries to do is prove the current system is unjust. I've never been asked to justify the current system, first of all, and second of all, note that at best, all he does is replace one injustice with another. Let's look at the affirmative side of the flow. In response to human rights, all he says is that the resolution asks for justice. Cross-apply what I said to his value of justice. A key component is human rights, and he universally violates that. As for the criterion, he says that we have government interference all the time. Once again, at best, all he's trying to do is prove that this is no worse than current precedents. He's not justifying the universal database, which is what the resolution asks him to do. Quite simply, my opponent is not debating this resolution. My first contention, first argument, he says there's no reason to accept the fact that people will fear the government, but they will because they will fear incriminating themselves. They think, okay, the government already has evidence against me. Why would they be questioning me? And this leads to the strained relationships, which less to the, the decrease in the, uh, in the conviction rate. He says that my evidence did not provide you a causal link, but it did because this was a per capita study done based on the crime rate and the conviction rate, and the conviction rate fell. Thus, less crimes are being solved. My opponent can offer you no benefits whatsoever. As for my second argument about over-reliance, group his responses together and realize that none of his arguments actually address the fact that by making this DNA database universal, you will be using it more, you will be over-relying on it, and it can produce and conclusive evidence. He never addressed that. On to my second contention, as far as self-incrimination is concerned, he said all that is is using language. That is not true. At the point the government forces you to give up evidence against yourself, you are bearing witness against yourself, which is a violation of a human right. Furthermore, I'd like to point out he drops the self-ownership argument. Flow it through to the affirmative side that by voting for the negative, you lose the right to make your decisions about your own body. You essentially become a slave of the government, and he never justifies that. Finally, I'd like to point out that he never addressed the fact that innocent people do not deserve to be slaves of the government. All he states is that, well, this happens all the time. That does not justify the compulsory universal database. Thank you. Take the last 215 to prep. Begin on the negative case and then move to the affirmative case. Okay. This round's gonna be very, very simple because he's not doing enough to actually address the real issues that I mentioned when solving discrimination because he just continues to disregard them and say, well, it doesn't matter in our conception of justice. So let us evaluate the value-value criterion debate and deal with that first. You can extend the value of justice. I tell you the resolution itself tells us we have to look to justice first. The fact that he says human rights are some component of it, yeah, that's absolutely true. That isn't relevant. The highest value of justice and the question is, do we adopt a system that gives each people person their due? Now, the question of giving due is, what is the effect on each individual human being? That's what we have to analyze today. If we happen to, uh, we happen to take someone's DNA, what is the harm to that human being? And then what is the benefit to the entire population? That seems pretty simple, and that's how we can analyze the resolution. So, extend the first observation on the negative case that tells you that we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is his problem with the concept, his conception of justice. I make this argument in my last speech, that his conception of justice says that anything that may harm a human being would be unjust, even if it leads to better results, which is always going to allow the perfect be the enemy of good to allow a system that we cannot actually protect our citizens as a whole, which is the duty of government. And the question today is what a government should do. 
then extend observation two. Observation two tells you that DNA databases are going to exist regardless. The question is, do we keep them just with felons or do we expand them to, expand them to everyone? He says this isn't relevant because I'm just bringing up a problem with the current system. But yes, it absolutely is relevant because we analyze whether DNA databases are good in, the, in, in comparison to the alternative. What do we do if we don't use them? And if it absolutely means that if we don't use them, that we get DNA dragnets, that we get discriminatory practices, then it is very, very clear that we should be using DNA databases. So the first affirmative voting, uh, the first negative voting issue can come out of the notion that we have to analyze the comparative analysis of the world, and his notion of justice never allows us to do it. His notion of justice is self-defeating, doesn't allow him to achieve justice because he would label anything as unjust. Then we can go to the value criterion. I tell you we have an obligation to get rid of discrimination, and here's the reason why. Because if we don't eliminate discrimination, no one would have any interest or reason to join government. The only reason why they engage in some kind of social contract is they believe they themselves are going to be protected. But if we eliminate the protections of government themselves, that disappears. So go to contention one. Extend the Peterson analysis that says we have discriminatory dragonists that exist in the status quo. He's saying I'm only just bringing up a problem with something else. No. If we don't use a compulsory DNA database, we have to use dragonists because we have to go and try to find the people who contain the DNA, who have the DNA that exists at the crime scene. It is 100% inevitable. So that means that we're always going to be having to use discriminatory practices and I can solve for discrimination. That's the second negative voting issue. Then you can extend the Saringhouse analysis. I tell you that we get rid of discriminatory practices on the whole. I tell you that, in fact, when we get a match and we're able to use law enforcement and say, hey, this is the person who committed the crime, then we absolutely know who did it and we don't need to use discriminatory practices. He doesn't address this issue. He just continues to say it is about another issue entirely, but it's absolutely not. Then he tries to claim it's a flaw in the criminal justice system. Well, just because there are flaws in the criminal justice system doesn't mean we shouldn't fight discriminatory practices right now. If we can prove that a limited DNA database leads to discriminatory practices, then we should try to fix those problems. Uh, then he reads, uh, and so this Rubenstein analysis doesn't actually give you specific explanation as to why the problem exists somewhere else. And then he says it's okay to discriminate against the criminal but he's not discriminating against the criminal. He's discriminating against everyone who is a member of a minority group or a certain socioeconomic group because the police go after those people specifically. It's not just criminals, it's all people in general. Then move on to the affirmative case. It's very simple. We have to compare and analyze how can we best achieve justice for all people on the whole. He says, I'm not being resolutional because I'm not talking about what justice is. Yes, I'm talking about justice as it exists in governments as they currently exist today and how can we best improve the lives of all human beings in general and best achieve the do for all people. Then, go on to the first contention. He tries to make an argument that people will fear incrimination and therefore they will, be hurt, they will ultimately not look to the police. But I tell you that this argument goes to me. I tell you that in fact when they believe the police and the DNA will be helped to make sure that they're innocent, they will in fact trust the police more. So that becomes the fourth negative voting issue because in fact they do trust the police more. Then I tell you his evidence has no causal link. And he says no, crime moved one way and something else happened a different way. That doesn't establish a causal link. It doesn't tell you that one thing causes caused the other, and I would tell you it absolutely doesn't. Then we can move on contention too. He talks about the notion that we force people to give up this information, but I tell you this happens all the time. It happens in the case of babies in which they, we, they're required to give up blood, and he says it doesn't matter if it happens all the time. I say it does matter if it happens all the time because his duty is to prove what is the real destruction. He talks about the absolute destruction of personal property of self. But I say that I had my blood removed as a baby to test for certain diseases. I don't feel a destruction of self or a destruction in some way. So unless he can explain what the implication of this is, why does it matter, what does it do to us as individuals, I would say eliminate discrimination, increase our trust, and in increase our trust in the criminal justice system. Then he talks about the notion of innocent until guilty. But treating someone as a suspect doesn't treat them as guilty. There's no reason why I actually fix this problem. But then the fifth negative voting issue comes in the eyewitness testimony analysis I give you that he does not answer. This is the Grady analysis. It's very simple. If we don't use DNA databasing, the absolute necessity is that we'll use eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony puts people away more, innocent people. So if we want to talk about human rights and the protection of human rights, I would say let's not put innocent people behind bars. So if we're looking to stop an injustice and DNA databasing absolutely stops these injustices, then it's a clear negative ballot. So the round is simple. First, we have to look to a comparative notion of justice. His justice is self-defeating. Once we look to that, I just eliminate discrimination in two specific ways. I increase the chances that we care about police, and I actually increase, uh, I stop false convictions.
I'd like to take a step back from all the minutia of this round and simply look at the resolution. What does it ask us? Compulsory inclusion within the database, is it just or unjust? Now let's look at what my opponent's arguments are all trying to say to you. His arguments say the current felon only database is just, therefore this compulsory database has to be just. He provides you no link for these arguments whatsoever, but furthermore, he's not debating this resolution. He's not debating inclusion within the database. He's saying what, this will, uh, what the database is going to do to the rest of society. Let's look at his voting issues. First of all, he talks about the comparative analysis of the world, and he also discusses the comparing, comparing to the alternative of eyewitness testing. First of all, I'd like to point out that he's trying to force me to justify a felons only database, but he's never proven to you why that's my burden. Second of all, I'd like to point out that pointing out flaws with a current system in no way serves as a justification for an expanded version of that same database. I'd also like to point out if you want to look at a comparative analysis, here's what you get. By voting for the negative, you are universally harming rights. Every single innocent person within the society will have the right to make their decisions about their own bodies taken away from them by the government. He never answered that in his last speech, and he never justified why the government can do that. But furthermore, if you want to still look at this comparative analysis, let's look at the benefits that he offers you. They're all speculative. Nowhere in the world right now do we actually have one of these databases, so he can't promise you a single one of these benefits. His second voting issue talks about discrimination. I'd like you to pull, st pull through the Mark Rothstein evidence, and here's the impact. This problem that he points out with discrimination is not with the database. A database is incapable of discriminating against someone. That is a problem with the police. So at best, all he's proven to you is that po some police can be racist. Okay, how does making a universal database that harms everyone's rights fix that? He never answers that for you. Now let's look at the affirmative voting issues. First are going to be the standards. The criterion of justified uh, government interference and the value of human rights are best upheld on the affirmative. My opponent tries to say we need to look to justice instead or justice is highest. He never impacted that whatsoever. Why is justice highest? At the point that he's universally harming human rights, that's an injustice. Your second affirmative voting issue is the fact that my opponent is not debating this resolution. We're supposed to be debating inclusion within the database, not is the previous database racist. My third and final voting issue is that by voting for the negative, there are guaranteed harms across the board. But also, he, he gives you no actual benefits. There is no way that he can prove any of these benefits will come true. It is speculation at best. So your three affirmative voters, the standards. Second, that my opponent is quite simply not debating this topic, so you have to affirm. And finally, that there are guaranteed harms with absolutely no benefits. Thank you.